Hey, Bruce, are you trying to talk? Because we can't um, we can't hear you yet. OK, it helps if I turn my mute button off. OK, thanks for that, Pascal. OK, well, welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to day three of the Steelhead um, workshop. Um, thanks for coming back. I think you'll be glad that you did. We have a lot of great presentations for you uh, lined up for today. And, um, I see we've got attendance growing by the minute here. Um, so um, let's get right into it in the name of time. Um, so just a quick reminder um, of the journey we've been on, um, at, you know, for particularly for those that maybe weren't here on all three days, but we spent some time on day one really focusing on what others are doing in other places and what some of the management challenges were and what we could learn from that. And uh, and then yesterday we took a deeper dive into what's happening in our own backyard and in particular on the Sacramento and some of its tributaries and on the Stanislaus and uh, try to look more specifically at um, at the monitoring that is going on and try to understand that. Uh, and then today we're going to um, after I share with you a little bit from yesterday, we'll get into um, analytical approaches that we can use for evaluating management actions. And so, as I said, we've got some good presentations. And as we've done the last two days, we'll have a breakout session at the end of today um, at 1130 uh, to 1230, very, you know, pretty much like we did um, the last two days with a different set of questions. So I hope you'll stick around for that. So, um, before I jump into the synthesis from yesterday, just um, a couple of observations I thought I'd share with you. Um, when I first got into this, Josh told me that uh, it was a little bit messy. And after the last two days and after pouring through the, um, the mural boards and all the notes from all the breakouts yesterday, I, I, I understand what he means. <laughs> And um, I was thinking this morning, it's a little bit like living in a household, a big household of a lot of people, right? And there's, if you have kids um, and maybe grandparents, you know, there's people of all different ages that are trying to live together. Um, people of different sizes, people want different things to eat. Some people like to travel, some people like to stay at home. And, uh, you know, it's messy. And um, if you're going to try to, you know, manage all that and figure all that out. You have to think about how you get organized and create some structure around that. And I think that's what ultimately we're talking about here at the end of the day. And we'll talk about that as I get into the synthesis a little bit. But I saw a lot of that in the breakout um, material from yesterday. A lot of a lot of suggestions for uh, frameworks and structures and standardization and organization. Um, which makes sense. So um, with that, I'll share my screen here. And we'll take a look at a few things from yesterday. So um, can somebody just give me a heads up that this, you're seeing my screen OK? Yep, we can see it. All right, great. Thanks, Brandon. OK, so breakout sessions from yesterday. Um, lots of good stuff, but one thing I realized is it wasn't an easy task. It wasn't an easy task for all of you to get into that level of detail and complexity, and it definitely wasn't an easy task for me to try to sort through it all this morning. Um, just as kind of an indication of that, this slide just shows from one great breakout group some initial brainstorming um, and some of the questions that surfaced. Um, and you can see it's a long list and it's, you know, each one of these questions is pretty complicated in its own right, much less all stacked together. And this is just one group of 10 people. So, um, you know, it, it's a lot of information. That said, you did it. I, and I was very impressed with the outputs um, from the groups. And again, this is just an example from one group. I'm not expecting you to necessarily read the details here, but uh, I think this was Jeff and Eva's group. And despite that long list of questions and you know um, a lot of ideas, 
they were able to start to organize it along a couple of axes here. This is along a data analysis axis. This is along a data collection. And I can't remember, Jeff, what this third one was. But, and, you know, they were able to start to think about how um, things might be prioritized and how they might relate to each other. Um, just as another example, this is from a different group and where they really started to think about a framework and how these different pieces fit together. And um, again, I don't expect you to see, you know, the fuzzy details here on these sticky notes, but you can start to see some of the concepts that were emerging. Uh, again, some thoughts about standardization um, and, you know, who's doing what, what's available, you know, how do you start to track these things? And um, so some really good work. So um, hats off to all of you for putting that in and tackling a difficult challenge. Um, so I'm going to try something different today. I'm going to start with my take homes rather than ending with my take homes and then I'll get into a little bit of detail. So um, I, I walked away from this exercise with really three take homes. Um, one, and this is not just from the input from yesterday, but also the presentations from yesterday that really there's some pretty sophisticated monitoring going on, right? It's not like we're starting from square one or we just don't know what we're doing. Um, but there are gaps and uh, which leads to the next point, which is that a lot of what's being done is pretty piecemeal. Um, and it's it's and I don't mean that in a negative way per se, but it just is what it is. It's very spatially dispersed and disconnected. Um, we have a lot of relatively short term data sets. It's hard to draw uh, conclusions about longer term trends um, and some of that's related to funding and that issue came up um, yesterday a fair amount. Um, and it, you know, as I mentioned already, it's not very well coordinated or standardized. Um, the the third take home here is my little bit of ray of sunshine or hope, and that is that I do think that there are some significant opportunities, and this also comes from your input um, to leverage depart to leverage partnerships to kind of build coalitions to to create uh, a more complete, sustainable, long term program with a little bit of effort, and uh, that can start with some interagency relationships and some standardization, um, but probably really also needs to involve non-agency stakeholders. As we saw yesterday, there's a long list of people interested and a lot that people can offer. And uh, so it doesn't have to just come from the agencies. So those are my take homes. I'm gonna try to quickly run through the questions. Um, so the first question was top priorities for monitoring. And I can tell you that um, you all were, you know, covered a wide landscape. And it's not, um, I wouldn't say there's consensus around these priorities, but uh, these are some of the things that, where I saw some commonality. Um, you know, this idea of moving towards some kind of spatially balanced and standardized approach to monitoring seemed to be a high priority, particularly if we want to roll this information up in some kind of an organized way to look more broadly across this large scale that we talked about yesterday. So that's number one. Another one that surfaced, and I just kind of tucked this all under on this category of ESA recovery, is just if this was a point that Steve um, uh, made yesterday that, you know, under a recovery kind of perspective, you know, if we really want to be able to track our success towards meeting that goal, we have to understand abundance and productivity and the population structure and diversity. And currently right now, in a lot of ways, we don't certainly not at a landscape scale. Um, number three really cuts to the heart of this workshop. It was triggered by a management need to develop a JPE for the San Joaquin Tribs so that, you know, um, arguably should be one of our priorities, one of our top priorities. And um, one, of, one of many things that were mentioned um, that relate to this is that, um, you know, marketing the juveniles uh, so that we can keep track of survival and movement is, uh, should be a priority if we wanna be able to get to some production estimates. Uh, number four here, another priority, uh, and, and there's lots of things that might fall under this, is just understanding how um, management affects the population. 
um, and, and human activities in general. Um, and there was a lot of information and conversation around hatcheries, it appears, um, and, and the impacts of hatcheries and you know, trying to monitor and understand that better. And you can see some of the things listed there. And then last number five, in terms of priorities, there was just seemed to be a lot of interest and conversation around just understanding, you know, the anadromy versus the residents and, and how that all fits into uh, the bigger picture. So those are priorities that I saw that emerged. Um, information needs given these priorities. Uh, again, there's a long list that we could draw from and there's a rich database of information in these mural boards. Um, but these are some of the things that I, I noticed, things like understanding um, or better understanding the number of adults that are returning um, and how they might be spreading themselves across the watershed, um, understanding the spawning distribution and, and habitat um, better um, understanding the reproductive success, particularly of non-hatchery fish. Um, just better information on out-migration trends from more tributaries. It seems like we have some good information from a few places, but not broadly. And then part of that is understanding growth and survival. And then the last item here I have on population structure and understanding that a little bit better. So these are, again, just some of the needs that seem to surface related to the priorities. Um, what's currently being monitored was the third question, and not too many of the groups tackled this. I think this is a tough one because, you know, no one individual um, necessarily or a group uh, has maybe a good handle on, on all that's being monitored. And I think that's why, you know, we heard from Mike Beeks yesterday about the effort to really try to kind of catalog and understand the monitoring better. But these are some of the things that um, a few people mentioned in terms of existing monitoring programs or information. And one thing you can see if you look at this list is this, this issue of kind of piecemeal or, or you know disperse information. Like we have maybe some good information on say habitat utilization in the American and the Yuba of the feather, but you know what about the other tributaries? Uh, similarly, you know, somebody mentioned there's some information about residents and anatomy on the Yuba, but that's just one tributary. So, um, another thing that we asked folks to do, and I thought this was an interesting display of this, was to think not only about what's currently being monitored, monitored but, you know, is it being monitored at the right scales? which again goes to this kind of dispersed nature of the information and at least this one group as you see most of the the thoughts ended up in this bottom right um, quadrant which is you know no they're not necessarily being um, monitored or implemented and they're also not at the right scale um, so that you know that suggests we've got some work to do again this is just the perspective of one group of people but um, so another question uh, dealt with uh, existing programs and other opportunities to modify those existing programs. And uh, these are some of the things that were mentioned in by a few of the groups. Um, quite a few things around, I just created this larger category of tagging. Um, and there's, you know, some people mentioned the opportunities to expand some of the existing acoustic tagging efforts. Um, opportunities to utilize genetic tagging more. Um, and then there's been quite a bit of talk in the last couple of days about pit tags. And we heard about the work on the Sacramento yesterday and the pit tag arrays and the challenges of, of you know, maintaining those. And um, so this idea of, of, you know, one way to kind of expand existing programs is think about maintaining um, and expanding those arrays. Um, you can see some of the other things listed here um, relative to some of the existing programs. Um, I put number five on here. You're going to obviously see a theme start to emerge here. Um, you know, it's not that that's so much of an existing program, but there seems to be interest in establishing uh, a little more of a comprehensive sampling framework. Um, you know, we've talked about this GRITS approach that 
other folks are using. It seems to have some um, real potential applicability here when we're trying to take a very large scale and um, you know monitor it in a way that um, we can scale it up. Um, and then this idea of a centralized data repository seems to be surfacing um, in quite a few places. So uh, last slide here, and then we can turn to our presentations. This is directly from one of the groups. This was Allison and, and Christie's group, and I just I thought it captured um, a possible roadmap. I thought it was a nice articulation of some steps that we could take. Um, you know, starting with this idea again of, of thinking about a standardized methodology, um, uh, some kind of basin wide repository, you know, focusing in on the on how to monitor juvenile production, um, thinking about how we utilize existing data sets, you know, the available information to inform, you know, our future monitoring. Um, this idea of reach. Um, specific survival rates. And then I wasn't in this group, but I think this idea of core one and core two locations relates to the sampling scale. Um, and you could sample different areas and different at different levels of intensity. So, um, and maybe I ask if Allison or Christy wants to say anything else about this um, before we move on. Anything you want to add since I stole this from your group? I don't even know if we have Allison or Christy. One second, Bruce. Let me uh, unmute everyone. Yeah, go ahead, Brandon. Okay, they should be able to now. Oh, okay. Hi, this is Allison. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot that we need the master to <laughs> no, uh, that's unmute great. everyone. <laughs> yeah, no, Christy captured some great notes from our discussion yesterday. And um, I think you're right, Bruce. Like, this is a possible way that we can kind of move forward and um, just a note about the locations core one and two, those are in reference to the NOAA fisheries recovery plan and the populations uh, that okay. are important and contribute to that. Um, so, yeah, I think that there was lots of great ideas and I appreciate you, Bruce, going through kind of everyone's thoughts and sharing them with us because there's a lot. We had a great discussion yesterday and there's a, there's a lot to put here and mind meld together. So thank you all for, you know, staying around after talks and participate in discussions and thanks to Bruce for summarizing all of this. Yeah, no, it was it really was very interesting, although a challenge. Um, okay, so we should thanks, Allison. So we should move on to our presentations, but there are a few reminders um, or items I'm supposed to mention before we do that, so that you're all aware. So, first of all, I think Ted was going to circulate some helpful hints on the teams issues. I don't know, Pascal or Brandon. Do you know if that went out to the group? I didn't notice. Yeah, this is Ted. I uh, I sent it out in, via email um, yesterday. So if anyone didn't get it, I can I can post the suggestions in the chat too. Great, thanks, Ted. And uh, so there there are a lot of great hints there. Um, thanks for doing that, Ted, and including how to manage the chat issues that we ran into yesterday. So hopefully we won't continue to have those today. So look for that. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is someone or several people suggested that um, one of the things we really miss when we do this remote approach is the opportunity for networking and kind of more one-on-one -on -one conversations and follow-up. And, and part of that is getting contact information from people. So what Pascal has done, uh, thank you Pascal, is on the workshop-wide mural board which is starting to accumulate some really good information um, she's created a row at the bottom and in that bottom row uh, she's put the contact information for the presenters so you can go there to find that and then we're putting out an open call to all of you to go in there and enter your contact information R rather than uh, than um, uh, putting that all in there without asking you first we thought it would make more sense to give you that opportunity to put your contact information in there and then it's your choice to do that or not do that. And then hopefully most of you or a lot of you will do that and then it will make it possible for us to find each other. So Pascal, anything you want to add to that? If you can, Franny can unmute you. <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks, Bruce. I, I also wanted to let everyone know that the videos 
from these uh, will be posted on the event page and I'll put the that in the chat as well. Great, thank you, Pascal. Okay, so Brandon, any other logistical things we should mention before we turn it over to our first presenter? Uh, no, just a reminder that if anyone runs into any issues, feel free to email engage at deltacouncil.ca.gov um, or you can call or text 916-798-9817. Thanks, Bruce. Great. Thanks, Brandon. All right, so Megan, um, without further ado, I'll pass it to you. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I think you need to stop sharing your screen first. Okay. One moment. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Megan Cook, and I am the CVPIA Science Coordinator. Um, I want to thank my co-authors, Jim Peterson and, and Adam Duarte. You'll hear from Adam after my talk as well. So today I'm gonna be talking to you about the CVPIA Science Integration Team and our structured decision-making and adaptive management process. To set the stage for anyone unfamiliar with CVPIA, this was a piece of legislation that gave equal priority to fish and wildlife considerations with the water and power uses and the operation of the Central Valley Project. Um, it's co-implemented by the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Bureau of Reclamation. And importantly, it established abundance goals for Chinook salmon, Omicus, and green and white sturgeon. Another really important um, document was the 2008 Listen to the River report um, that gave our program some hard truths, you know, that we needed to rethink the entire approach in implementing CVPIA and essentially do a better job if we were ever to hope to meet the abundance goals. Um, and in particular, this report pointed to establishing a science-based framework built upon an adaptive management approach. And so to help meet this need, um, meet this need, the CVPIA science integration team was established and the SIT is a collaborative technical team of stakeholders and scientists and membership is open to anyone with interest and willingness to be a part of the process. And I know many folks here today are part of the SIT as well. And so boiled down, the SIT's role is to agree on a set of quantitative restoration objectives and then inform and interpret a set of decision support models in order to prioritize restoration actions that we expect to best meet um, those restoration objectives. And so the result of the science integration team process kind of starting at the end, but um, so this is our five year near term restoration strategy uh, was completed last year and it was a really big milestone um, for the program. And so this strategy includes priority restoration actions for Chinook salmon and then priority information needs for Chinook salmon, steelhead and sturgeon. And it's intended to cover five years, but the SIP process enables annual updates if new information improves the models and then the subsequent prioritization. And so today I'm going to talk to you about this process, you know, how we got here, um, specifically for Chinook salmon, you know, able to get to these restoration action priorities um, and sort of outline that as where we're hoping to get with steelhead. Um, then I'll go over how far we have been able to get with steelhead and then Adam's talk directly after mine will go into some more detail on the steelhead side of things. And so it's important, you know, to to outline sort of the foundation of the SIT process is structured decision making. And so through this process, the SIT you know, defines the decision context relating to the management problem, um, identifies fundamental objectives along with quantifiable attributes for those objectives, um, and then identifies these candidate management actions or restoration strategies is what we call them. Um, and then the next step is to develop decision support models. And these uh, decision support models are used to predict those changes in those quantifiable attributes that describe the fundamental objectives um, you know, after implementing these candidate restoration strategies. After that is to you know, conduct a sensitivity analysis to identify the uncertainties that are most influential on those candidate restoration strategies. And kind of once all that's done, you know, finalize the prioritization. So, so through this, I really want to emphasize that this process starts with objectives. You know, you can't decide what to do until you know what you're trying to achieve. And then without objectives, you know, everything can be a priority. Then to put structured decision making in context with adaptive management, 
you know, the, the results of our structured decision making process are reflected in the near term restoration strategy and those priorities. Then the implementing agencies, you know, decide which specific projects to fund. And then as those projects produce results, we can observe outcomes and, and continually learn. So this is considered single loop learning in adaptive management. And, you know, so this is where the sit is for Chinook Salmon um, over the five year timeline of the near term restoration strategy. So each year we'll, you know, take in new information, um, add that into the model, kind of see how that changes and updates. The second loop represents double loop learning in adaptive management um, and this involves revisiting objectives. So the SIT will enter the second loop when it's time to develop the next version of the five year near term restoration strategy. Um, but for this, this current strategy, we will not be revisiting um, the objectives that have been established. Then what does this process actually look like for Chinook Salmon? Um, so before I really dive into the details, just wanted to note that the SIP process, you know, modeling has evolved over the last several years. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to present the most current version, but maybe reference a little bit how some of that has changed over time. So currently the the SIT's fundamental objectives for Chinook Salmon. So these have actually simplified over time, and, and now we have a current focus on three valley-wide objectives and two uh, tributary-specific objectives. And um, in developing the restoration strategies, you know, really focusing on the valley-wide objectives of total juvenile biomass, natural adult production, and spatial diversity. So the spatial dimensions for the model have expanded over time, and currently we're including you know, all the CVPA watersheds, the migratory corridor, uh, and the delta, which is divided into 13 zones. So now as we're getting into the modeling aspects, I'm going to be showing you a much simplified version of what happened. Um, Adam's talk will go in a little bit more depth on some of these technical aspects. So on this side, you know, don't worry about trying to see all of the detail, but wanted to show representation of the Chinook salmon models. Um, the runs are modeled separately with some different timing and inputs, but essentially the same structure. Um, and uh, what I really want to emphasize, you know, these are decision support models. So the purpose of these models is to help evaluate trade-offs between different management actions or restoration strategies, um, and does that by quantifying the expected effects on the SIT's fundamental objectives which again are the juvenile biomass, natural production, and spatial diversity. So this overall model shown here contains numerous submodels. So the arrows are pointing out some of those submodels. And we now have over 190 parameters in the model. So the model has gotten more complex over time. And changes and additions to this model are based on you know, SIT member expertise and, and contributions. You know, I just wanted to say, you know, although we've added complexity to the model, you know, we're still seeing similar elements being the most influential and important. So that can give us, you know, some greater confidence that we're identifying the right things. And then in terms of the information that's really driving the model, you know, we've made a lot of progress here. Earlier versions of the model relied heavily on expert um, knowledge and, and opinion, and we've come a long way. And you know, there are still some um, elements where the information is based pretty much only on expert opinion. Most of the model at this point uses you know, empirical data, published reports, and we're always on the lookout for new and updated information to continue improving here. And once the model is in place, um, SIT members identified various sort of suites of restoration actions or those restoration strategies. Uh, this slide is showing the standardized units of effort we use to describe those actions. So, you know, spawning habitat, looking at multiples of one acre, internal habitat, multiples of two acres, floodplain, three acres, um, and then increasing juvenile survival in, in half a percentage um, increments. And so here, this is wanted to show an example of the type of model output the SIT would assess. And so this particular graph is scaled using a utility function to allow some more direct comparison between the runs, um, which are very different run sizes. Um, so on the x-axis is the valley-wide natural production utility, and scores range from zero for the worst strategy to one for the best strategy. And then the different Chinook salmon runs are shown in the blue, orange, and gray bars. Here, these arrows are highlighting where there are different strategies that were identified as, based on the model output, be identified as best for the different Chinook runs. Um, 
So as you can see, you know, the, the bottom one for spring run, it's really good for spring run, but the bars for winter and fall run are, are very small. So it's not as simple as just picking the best strategies based solely on this output. You know, this output is interpreted and supplemented with the expertise of the SIP members. And so I'm going to skip over maybe some of the more detailed elements of that SIP discussion and some other aspects of a modeling output and kind of wave a magic wand and say, you know, through all of that, the SIP was able to agree on a set of restoration actions for Chinook salmon that would, um, you know, based on the best information we have at the time, maximize those objectives of juvenile biomass, adult production, and spatial diversity. So, so this is where we've landed. So we have now nine priority restoration actions for Chinook salmon. And for us, a priority, you know, it specifies a restoration action in a particular geographic location. I uh, just wanted to note that the numbering here does not indicate any kind of priority order or sequential numbering. But some examples of what these priorities look like, you know, we've got uh, juvenile habitat restoration in the main stem Sacramento River above the American River, Con American River confluence, or we've got juvenile habitat restoration in Clear Creek. Uh, down at the bottom of the list, you know, is also deemed a priority to maintain existing spawning habitats. You know, the model sort of assumes that any existing habitat will uh, maintain, so it's important to keep that moving forward as well. And so, you know, the SIT doesn't stop at just identifying those restoration priorities. You know, potentially equally as important is assessing the sensitivity of the model to the various inputs and, and the parameters which are shown here. And so, you know, we can see that um, existing habitat is one of the most influential model inputs. Um, and then for winter on Chinook, the initial abundance was also very influential. Then looking at the model parameters themselves, um, you know, many kind of demographic uh, parameters here. So we've got multiple juvenile survival parameters, juvenile growth and body size, reproduction, and adult survival. And so, you know, this list of um, of items are really key components of, of the SIT's determination of the priority information needs for Chinook salmon, and those are also included in the near-term restoration strategy. You know, what this means is essentially, you know, reducing uncertainty in these areas are going to improve the model output um, and then ultimately the confidence in the recommended priorities. So, you know, we're close to closing that first adaptive management loop for Chinook salmon. You know, that we've got the priorities in the near-term restoration strategies, you know, that informs the decision making by the CVPIA implementing agencies for project funding. Um, we've also developed monitoring guidelines um, for restoration actions to help improve some consistency across projects and uh, ensure, you know, the necessary information is being produced. Um, and again, highlight, you know, some of that really necessary information is a lot of that dem demographic information I showed on the previous slide. And then over, you know, the five years of the strategy um, timeline, the SIT will incorporate new and updated information and update the models accordingly. And if any of those model updates kind of show that we need to update the prioritization, that can also happen on a regular basis. So, you know, we want to be able to kind of get to this place with Steelhead, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. Okay, so what did we do with Steelhead? So to kick off the process, um, the Steelhead project work team provided the subject matter expertise, and many of these folks were also regular SIT members. Um, I did want to note that the San Joaquin Basin was underrepresented in these conversations, so we welcome you know, additional folks to help provide that expertise and perspective. So the project work team um, developed that conceptual model for Steelhead, um, and then the initial quantitative model based on that conceptual model. Um, and so for Steelhead, the modeling focus is, again, to inform management trade-offs and also consider hypotheses related to anadromy, and more on that to come from Adam. So when the group got to assessing the data available to populate the, the decision support model, they determined really, you know, there was not sufficient data to be able to trust the model at this point and use it to develop those restoration actions and strategies. So instead, the group determined that the best use um, of the five-year period of the near-term restoration strategy for Steelhead would be to prioritize those data needs and help fill in those data gaps. So through this process, you know, much of the discussion focused on what facilitates anadromy, and you can see that reflected in the list of objectives um, that were developed for, for Steelhead. And so you know, we've got things like the frequency of anadromous life history, number of spawning anadromous, um, Omicus, natural production of anadromous omicus, uh, omicus, spatial diversity of the spawning anadromous uh, omicus, and then some uh, more demographic metrics, you know, population growth, um, recruits to certain age classes, and then an overall, you know, increase in, in fitness and genetic diversity of omicus. 
But through these discussions, it was actually quite difficult to come up with hypothetical restoration actions for steelhead. So that's a pretty big need that we still have moving forward. I wanted to sort of share, you know, what these information priorities for steelhead ended up looking like and kind of the overarching priorities to so identify factors that facilitate anadromy and then the sort of specific information needs include, you know, quite a lot of demographic information, um, improved habitat estimates, spatial distribution of anadromy, and then long term monitoring needs for small production and escapement. And also wanted to add that, you know, the SIT noted it'd be really useful to address some of these demographic needs by comparing tributaries with different environmental conditions. Um, that way we can assess the effects of those environmental conditions on demographic rates and then ultimately on anadromy. So, so what's next? You know, really our goal is to improve the steelhead decision support model enough to be able to develop those restoration priorities um, for steelhead for the next near-term restoration strategy. And so part of that is going to be continue seeking and integrating additional data. Some of you might be getting a call sometime soon. You know, we learned a lot this week about things that are going on and data that we weren't aware of before. Um, and also, you know, when appropriate, we may convene additional expert workshops to work through the current state of knowledge and figure out how to, you know, best incorporate that into the steelhead DSMs. Um, we're also, you know, as I mentioned, going to need to come up with hypothetical restoration actions, which has, you know, been difficult so far. So, you know, we need your ideas. So, really, just want to, you know, the sit is open to anybody who would like to join, and you know, we welcome additional expertise. Um, I put up the the date and time of our next call, which is actually next week, and um, all the information you need is on the website there. So, I just welcome, you know, anybody to please reach out to me if you have questions, if you want to join the science integration team, or need some more information, kind of on the steelhead specific aspects. Um, please let me know. And with that, I will take questions. Great, thanks, Megan. Um, so we do have a couple minutes if folks have questions. And uh, let's see, uh, Brandon, I'm not sure how that works with everybody being muted per se. I guess if you raise your hand, we can unmute you. Maybe that's the way to do this. So if you have a question, raise your hand. It looks like I've got something from Jeff. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, we can. Thanks, Jeff. Yes. How about that? Thanks, Megan. That was a good presentation. I uh, I think it's pretty obvious we need we need some organization. We need some sort of group or something um, in the San Joaquin Basin. And I'm just curious to know um, who would lead such a group. What would you be your recommendation? Would it be the f f you know? Because it's obvious you need to have like a consistent group to lead a group <laughs> or an agency or any suggestions about that now that you've been through this process for a while hmm jeff that's a really great question um i you know i, I don't i'm not sure the best answer to that so so folks might know i'm still pretty new in, in my position i just started with cvpa um at the end of last summer so i'm still kind of getting to know all the different um folks involved and um so, so Jeff, I'm not really sure. I think that warrants, I think, a broader discussion. I, you know, I think that might be a really helpful discussion even with this group of, you know, there's a lot of different folks involved. Um, you know, the SIT has, is, really, is a really useful forum for folks to come together on different priorities. And um, so that could potentially be a, a helpful starting place. You know, I don't know that it would uh, yeah. be the only place or the best place, but, um, you know, I, I know from the SIT perspective, we absolutely want to be involved in any kind of, um discussion of that nature and you know there's obviously so many information needs that we share you know we want to be able to kind of incorporate and, and coordinate as as closely as possible so um so that's, a, that's the best i know at this point but i think yeah. yeah i'm happy to be a part of any conversations about how best to set something up like that yeah thanks i know the the big groups they're they're thought of as you know time consuming and oh long meetings and all that but boy do they serve an important function I think we're learning that <laughs> yeah it's amazing how what we can learn just by all getting together on a big yeah you know, teams call so um, we have one minute so I don't Brad I see you got your hand up we could take one more quick question thanks hey Megan can you briefly just say a little bit about what this the scope of the CVPIA effort and this modeling effort is? I mean, are you trying to represent the, the entire world of management actions that might 
help salmon and steelhead or is it narrower than that? That's a great question. I think in the conversation so far, the group wasn't able to, didn't feel, my understanding, so all this was taking place before I was on board, so a little grain of salt there, but, um, you know, the group didn't feel comfortable even kind of coming up with those hypothetical uh, actions, so I'm I'm not totally sure, but I think, you know, it's a pretty wide open field for, you know, the types of actions that can be considered. I'll maybe ask Adam to jump in if I'm misstating any of the, the past uh, discussions. Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Megan. I think one of the things that SIT tried to focus on was things or actions that the CPA program could actually fund. So there are certain things that just aren't within the purview of CPIA. So prioritizing those for a CPIA uh, process probably isn't the best use of their time. Great. Thanks, Adam. So uh, I'm going to suggest we uh, close out the questions for Megan. Thank you, Megan. And uh, we move on to the next presentation. And it sounds like, um, Adam, you're going to take that. Is Jim, Jim's not here or you're going to do the presentation? Is that what I'm gathering? <laughs> yep. Uh, Jim was double booked in, in the land of uh, t endless team meeting. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> very good. <laughs> All right. Take it away. Yeah, since uh, I'm giving the talk, I changed the, the title to I don't know why. But anyways, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, of course, uh, Lauren Diaz and Jim Peterson. And so we were asked to talk about how to incorporate multiple life history hypotheses on into decision making. And so that's sort of the, the focus of this talk using quantitative tools. So this is sort of how we think about uncertainty in natural resource management. And so the title is Decision Making Under Uncertainty, Dueling Models Presents Opportunities, Not Barriers. And I guess my point there is, is that we can disagree on science and we can have multiple hypotheses on how the system works. All that does is present an opportunity for us to learn. So when talking about this, I thought I'd start off with a very basic thing, right? What, what is management? We all know this. It's taking an action to obtain some desired resource outcome. Ask anybody in the world what you need in order to manage a system. They'll tell you at least two things. You need an objective that we're trying to achieve, and you need a range of alternative actions that you can take in order to achieve those objectives. Something that sometimes gets left, left off the list, though, is that you need a model. You need a model to understand how the system works. And let me tell you a bit about what I mean by that. So let's say we were monitoring steelhead on the stand and we looked at the population over time. We saw there was a dip in the numbers. And what, what do we do, right? Well, we can ask the two experts in the room and these experts might give us two different answers. One expert says we need to increase habitat by five hectares. The other says we need to increase habitat by one hectare. Maybe I'm in the room and you ask me, I'm young, I'm not a fisheries biologist. Maybe I'm just super aggressive. So I'm just like, nah. 20 hectares, that or nothing. So how can we all look at the same numbers and come up with very different suggestions on what to do? Well, it's possible that I just don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but let's just focus in on these two experts here. You know, they, they both have the same objective. They both have the same decision alternatives in front of them, increase habitat by some amount. And maybe, at least on the surface, they have the same model on how the system works. You increase habitat, you increase abundance. But there's an infinite number of ways in which you can draw a positive line relationship between habitat and population size. For example, if you have, if you believe in this more asymptotic relationship shown here in the red, I don't know if you can see my dot, my cursor here or not, but um, you would increase habitat to some amount. After which you would stop because you start seeing a, a lock, lack of return on investment. If you believe in this habitat model or this model right here, the exponential model, you would you wouldn't bother increasing habitat unless you got to some threshold. Um, after which you'd see that population response, or maybe it's a linear relationship where you just think, if I keep increasing habitat, I'll keep re increasing fish numbers. I'm not going to pretend to know which one's right, but I will say is that these represent dueling models for different hypotheses on how the system works. And if we don't incorporate these dueling models into our decision-making process, what you end up in is conflict. And if you don't explicitly link those things in some sort of quantitative framework, or at least picture what these things look like, Oftentimes, we get into these arguments because we just don't see how the other person doesn't understand what we see. Um, and this is often the, the, the reason behind that. And so there's got to be a way for us to use this uncertainty within our decision-making process and still make good decisions. And I think that that method uh, is adaptive management. So Megan already talked about what adaptive management was. So I'll skip to this next slide. It basically says, well, what does this mean? Well, it means that monitoring 
management, and science are all three legs to the same stool. You need all three in order to have effective decision making within an adaptive management context. But it also means that the results of these efforts must communicate. So doing each of these separately without regard to how these things will integrate later, usually and get to in a spot where it's hard to crosswalk how you pull these things together. A more efficient way to do this is just a, at the onset of these projects to start figuring out ways for us to work together and pull these pieces in as they're built. So here's another look at what adaptive management looks like. So what we're talking about here in the Central Valley are a series of Markov decision processes. Markov decision process is just a fancy way of saying we make repetitive decisions either over space or through time where we implement an action and hopefully that action will influence the population we're trying to manage. And again, hopefully it influences that population in the direction we want it to go. So in a typical management approach, um, you have a current population, you implement some management action, and it influences what that population is at the next time period. An even better approach is one in which you integrate monitoring, right? You have to know where you are before you make a decision, and it'd be great to figure out if you got where you wanted to be. Um, this is a great approach, it really is. But at the end of the day, an even better approach, particularly when there's lots of uncertainty in how a system works, is to integrate science into that process. What I mean by that is, let's say we have two different hypotheses on how the system works, two different dueling models. We develop quantitative models that represent those hypotheses. We take that monitoring data and feed that through the models in order to make predictions on what would happen if we did actions A, B, C, whatever, right? And you go through and you make the best decision based off your intuition, based off the models, based on whatever you want it to be. But what's important is, is that you monitor the system afterwards. You take those model predictions, you combine them with the monitoring data to figure out how good you are at estimating the system that's being managed. And you use that information, then update model weights, model weights being your belief in those different hypotheses. And the idea is if you do this through space and time, over, over time, you will eventually make better predictions, which will allow you to make better management decisions. So the CPA has been going through this uh, SDM process for, for quite a while. Um, and as Megan pointed out, we've, we've had some steelhead efforts, so I'm not gonna go too much in detail about that process. But I will say that we've developed a model and we had stakeholder meetings. A lot of the folks on this call were on, during the, in those stakeholder meetings. And there was a lot of discussions focused on what causes a fish to become an Um And so that'll be the focus of these dueling models. Just for the sake of completeness, I wanted to point out that yes, we do have a conceptual model overall for Omicus DSM. And yes, it is very different than the Chinook salmon one. That's because we're talking about a different fish with different life history strategies. So, not a surprise to anybody on this call. Just wanted to point out that we're not trying to shoehorn Chinook stuff into Amicus things. But similar to the Chinook model, we do have conceptual models for each transition. So each survival estimate, each reproduction estimate. Uh, here's an example of one for Chinook or for Omicus, excuse me. This is juvenile survival. Each of these things are things that are hypothesized to influence juvenile survival things in purple or things that we have data for or some sort of estimated relationship from the literature. Things that are here that are blank are things that we don't have data for. Um, and it's worth pointing out that I cherry picked a transition that had the most purple, had the most information. A lot of the transitions we have in the, in the current model have a lot of unknowns. So back to uh, this idea of anatomy. So essentially in the, in the DSM, a fish has different decision points or decision windows on, on what it can do. Um, at a monthly time step, it, it definitely moves all over the place. Uh, fish are allowed to move, grow, survive, whatnot. Um, but from just following a fish from age zero through age four plus, we see that they emerge around May. Smelting can happen in May as well as October. We include this half pounder life history strategy as well. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Everything above the line here is um, freshwater environments and everything below the line is, is saltwater environments. But all I want to point out here is that we have fish and some of them go to the ocean. But what makes them go to the ocean? What makes something anadromous? Well, based on the conversations we had with the group, there was at least, there was five hypotheses. One is just genetic propensity, right? Whether your probability of becoming an anadromous fish is based off one, your, the sex of the, that fish, but also the parents, wh whether they were anadromous or residents. 
The other one has to do with stream flow. The idea being if there's variable flows in March through September, perhaps they will increase the odds that a fish becomes anadromous. The third one was temperature. So higher temperatures in June and August would make things become more anadromous. The other one's body size. This idea that fish growth, uh, faster fish growth equals a higher probability, higher odds that that fish will become anadromous. And the last one is geographic location. So the idea being if you're further from the delta, you're less likely to go out to the ocean. I think the idea there, and I'm probably wrong in this, but the idea there was that if you're farther from the delta, you have more options uh, before you would ever hit salt water, so you're less likely to be anadromous. Um, so these are our five hypotheses. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. We totally recognize that. In the model, it incorporates all five, and currently our weight or our belief in these different hypotheses is set at equal. Uh, that can be changed. It's certainly um, something that can be done. For example, the uh, adaptive waterfowl harvest management strategy that they do for, for ducks is based off, or was originally based off of a stakeholder group simply voting on what they thought their favorite hypothesis was, using those as initial model weights. The reason why it's sort of a kind of whatever moment is because you can update these model weights, and you should be updating these model weights with monitoring data. So after the first set of management actions, Ideally, these initial model weights will be totally tied to what you're monitoring in the system. So what do you do with this model? Well, in our case, what we, we try to do with it is optimization uh, of this for Chinook salmon. So optimization is simply saying is we took the model and we solved the model by giving it a set of constraints, a set of options, and a, an objective it wants to achieve, and it, it shows the best strategy uh, over space and time. So what do you need for optimization? Well, you need the same exact thing as you need for management. So we weren't really asking too much of the model or even too much of, of the set. For the Chinook salmon example that Megan presented, we looked at using stochastic dynamic programming, which is just a fancy way of saying we took a, a model and we included stochasticity and it's a Markov decision process and it looks at what's the best action now and into the future based off the current population. So it takes that population information, the decisions that are in front of it, and it maximizes what that next population is going to be what that, for our objectives, right? It, it does the best thing it can do for that population through time. What's nice about this approach is it incorporates uncertainty. That includes environmental and demographic stochasticity, so just random draws like you would expect in any life cycle model. It includes partial controllability. So partial controllability is basically when you go out to do an action in real life, you don't always hit the nail on the head, right? Sometimes we create a little more or a little less habitat just because life happens, um, but we try to get some, some threshold. And it also includes model uncertainty. So those are those dueling models and those model weights, right? It just uses those to predict forward, again, to maximize that, that objective. This is the output you would get from stochastic dynamic programming. This is an example from our Chinook salmon models. It's got on the top here an information state, which is juvenile survival within a tributary. It's got system states on the left and, and uh, sorry, on the Y and X axis. So in this case, it's spawning habitat per red over the last five years, and juvenile rearing habitat per red over the last five years. And the idea being is if you go to a tributary, you know what juvenile survival is, you know what spawning habitat is, you know what rearing habitat is, you know how many fish have been using that tributary on average for the last five years, you know what action is optimal based on the objectives and model that we used. So as you have lots of habitat, lots of spawning habitat, lots of rearing habitat. Maybe you do a survival action. If you become, uh, you have a lot less rearing habitat, you would do a rearing habitat. It's, it's, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but we also know that not every tributary has survival between 50 and 60 percent. So we solve the model using different information states, anywhere from 0.1 all the way to greater than 80 percent survival. And as you would expect, survival changes what you would do within a tributary, just slightly though. Um, and then we also know that not every tributary is the same. So we essentially broke up these tributaries into multiple tributary types and solved the model for each of these. So what do you do with that? You can simulate things forward. And that's what we did. We simulated 20 years under different alternative rule sets and simply looked at what do we get for these different strategies. And Megan gave you an example of this that looks slightly different. But essentially, was we combined all the utilities from the different runs into a single value, just to simplify what we're looking at. The black is everything where you wait different runs equally. The gray is when you do a multi multiplicative weighting, which essentially means is you would never choose the worst action for a particular for any run. 
But let's focus on this equal weighting thing. Here, strategy six comes out as the best. But we know from Megan's talk that strategy six wasn't the best for spring run. So the question is, is how much would we have to value spring run relative to the other runs before we would do something different? And you can ask that question. So essentially what we did here is we weighted spring run equal from zero, we don't care about it, to one. It's the only run we care about. And the top line here represents the best strategy. And essentially strategy six is the best strategy until you weight spring run at 0.5, after which strategy nine becomes the best strategy. What that means is, is you'd have to value spring run twice as much as fall run and, and uh, winter run before you would do a different strategy based off this model. Whether or not that's true or not is, is of course, up to the decision makers and, and the science integration team. Um, the other thing you do about it is uh, do with this is look at which uncertainties matter. So this is response profile analysis here on the right side of the screen. And basically these lines represent different strategies, the top line being the, the best strategy based off the model. And most things are in this bottom right quadrant where things are stochastically dominant. It, what that means is anytime, wh whether we make something really small, really big for these different parameters, the same management strategy ends up being the, the best. In some cases though, that's means that top strategy switches. And these uncertainties, or these parameters, are what we call key uncertainties. As you guys know, just based on these talks we've had the last three days, we don't have all the money in the world to monitor everything. So it's good to identify what the key uncertainties are, but it's even better to weight these key uncertainties on which one we'd like to go after next. And you can do that by calculating what's called the value of information. So essentially you can use the model to evaluate how many more fish you can squeeze out of the system by reducing uncertainty in particular parameters. And that's something the science integration team has done for Chinook salmon. So Omicus is different in a lot of ways. Um, we all know this, but one way in particular they're different is that there's quite a bit of uncertainty in what causes something to become anadromous. So maybe we don't want to use stochastic dynamic programming. Another option is to use adaptive stochastic dynamic programming. This is known as an active adaptive management strategy. It essentially does the same exact thing. The key difference here is that it considers opportunities to learn. So whereas for Chinook, we were focused on just maximizing that utility, those objectives, right? For Omicus, you can maximize those objectives while considering the fact that there's opportunities to adjust your belief in these hypotheses. And that's what ASDP does. So I don't have a fish example, so I'm talking about a wallaby here. Uh, this is essentially in, in Australia. They had two different wallabies. So they can translocate into populations, site A and site B. Site A is something they knew something about, they knew quite a bit about. Site B was this unknown site. They just found it, they didn't know a whole lot about it. There's a lot going on here, um, so let me walk through it quickly. On the x-axis is death rate at site B. On the columns, this is the number of females at site A, so that's a site they know quite a bit about. On the, uh, the rows here represents death rate at site A. And this y-axis represents their confidence in the death rate at site B. So this is how much, how confident they are in the x-axis. And it's worth pointing out here that these are different strategies on top of one another. The shading represents the uh, passive adaptive management strategy, so what we use for Chinook salmon. The symbols represent an active adaptive management strategy where you want to learn. Dark shading is the same thing as the solid circles. Light shading is the same thing as triangles. And no shading is the same as crosses. And I know that's a lot. And all I'm trying to point out here is that these things are in largely in agreement with, an, uh, with one another. You would never do something that's just totally bad. But what you do do is when you have lots of uncertainty, so you're lower on this y-axis, you might perturb the system just a little bit more. Because if there's low uncertainty, there's high value and learning so you can make decision, make better decisions moving forward. So we have all these cool tools, we have these models, so why don't we just solve the thing and move forward? Well, as Megan talked about, what we use the model for this first pass is to identify data unavailability, which is helping us guide our targeted data gathering efforts over the next few years. Um, yeah. So in conclusion, I wanted to leave you with this idea that monitoring, management, and science are all three legs to the same stool. You need all three to do effective decision making, especially when there's high uncertainty. Adaptive management is a science-based uh, management approach. It's not research. It's a formal quantitative decision making process to evaluate trade-offs and figure out where there's opportunities to learn. But to do that, you need monitoring. It's flexible. There's no problem that's too complex. There's no system that's too complex to model or too uncertain. Uh, that's exactly what adaptive management was developed for. And dueling models aren't a barrier to learning. 
or aren't a barrier to decision making. All it is is an opportunity for us to learn within some sort of formal quantitative framework. And I'll leave by saying decision support models simplify the problem focus discussion. They're not decision makers. Um, science integration team uses them to focus the, the discussions and they use their expertise to then develop those priorities. They're also not about modeling. We're not trying to model every single ecologically important thing for fish. We're simply trying to model the things that matter with respect to decision making. And I would say that a good decision support model identifies information needs and the effects of uncertainty to help you all identify where key monitoring gaps are with respect to the decisions and objectives you have. So with that, I'll do my last plug uh, with joining the SIT. We definitely need more Micus experts on the SIT, and we'd be happy to talk to you about how to, how to do that if you're interested. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Great, thanks, Adam. Appreciate that very much. I love the way you make it sound like it's all very straightforward and simple. <laughs> <laughs> it always is after the fact. Yeah. Um, so we don't really have time um, for questions without starting to cut into our subsequent presenters, but um, check the chat. I haven't noticed whether people posted any questions, but if you wouldn't mind, just kind of give that a quick look and see if there's yeah. anything in there. Definitely. All right, so we are going to shift to talking about development of a JPE for spring run. So, um, Pete, are you out there somewhere? Not Pete. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I got somebody we else. Okay. Switch on you. All right, that's okay. Um, Is that Brett? Did I hear? It's Brett. I'm trying to oh, bring okay. it up. Hopefully, you see something. Um, there it is. And without further ado, I'll get my laser pointer ready just in case. So the title of this talk is No Time to Lose. And by, I'm Brett Harvey, by the way. I am the um, newly created DWR lead for um, implementing the salmon-related provisions of the state um, incidental take permit for the operation of the state water project. It's a mouthful. Um, this show is really both Ted's show, and then I adapted it somewhat. And Ted is is really is our DWR lead scientist. But we call it no time. I'm calling it no time to lose because essentially we've had to hit the ground running um, in order to develop a juvenile production estimate for spring run under what you know I I consider a very short timeline. So this talk is just sort of letting people know where we're at and the process that we're taking. And hopefully that'll help inform um, a similar process for, for San Joaquin Steelhead. Um, so first, you know, why do we need a spring run juvenile production estimate? It, the spring run are both um, federally and state listed under the Endangered Species Acts. Um, primarily, we need it as a, a way to uh, I, we here we say entrainment management at the um, state pumping facilities, but the way that the um, regulars and the permitters they could say it's a minimization measures. Um, and in the ITP, um, so we, you know we, we're required to protect the salmon during this entrainment season when the salmon are migrating. Currently, we use spring run surrogates. But the idea is we're going to be moving towards much more like the winter run model, where we produce a JPE every year. Um, similarly, in the the federal um, preferred alternative, th they're required to develop a performance measure, and this spring run JPE may fulfill that as well. Um, and also, in in this, I want to and you know, shortchange this, we, we're hoping to develop a lot of new data that'll really be valuable for other management issues, and in particular, um, spring run management, besides just entrainment management. There's also, a, there's a provision in the ITP that we have to support the division of a spring run life cycle model, and so we're hoping this will really help that as well. So just just to reiterate, the, the focus of the juvenile production estimate is really to get an estimate of how many juvenile spring run are entering the delta so that we can use that um, essentially if it's if it's acceptable to the um, to what we're calling the ITP adaptive management team, um, have that 
become a way to come up with a take uh, annual take estimate and then use that to manage um, entrainment or the lack of entrainment, hopefully, of spring run at the water div diversions. Um, so the first step thing we did is we had a workshop very much like this one. And a lot of ideas came out of that workshop. And um, most of the rest of this talk um, is is basically describing how we um, wrapped a lot of those ideas into a plan. Um, so immediately after the workshop, we put together as nimble a team as we could. Um, not a lot of people to help us with that. Um, I won't go through all the names. Um, people, these people know who they are. Um, I will say that the one um, organization, strangely, that wasn't on this core team and um, was the Fish and Wildlife Service, but we've since remedied that. Um, and they're now on our what we're calling our core team. Um, this is mainly funded by DWR. In fact, we DWR has to fund um, anything that we want to claim credit for as far as development of the JPE and meeting the conditions of the ITP, the inner, the, um, the take permit. Um, but we're getting lots of input from, from regional staff across the Central Valley. Um, we're ma mainly focused on the Sacramento spring run and um, because the San Joaquin population is considered an experimental population um, at this point. DWR is in really, in, but really in the driver's seat here. Um, but we're working hand in hand with the Department of Fish and Wildlife to really to make this thing work. Hmm. Screen froze. Hold on a sec. There it goes. So, just to give you an idea of where we've come from and where we're going, um, we had these weekly meetings in the fall for about six to eight weeks, and in that time, we drafted a plan. Um, we we met our deadline and submitted it on the day, the last day, you know, it was due to Department of Fish and Wildlife for them to review. Got a lot of comments, spent another six weeks or so revising the plan and resubmitted it. Um, and that's, now we're down below this line. We've actually just been told that it's unofficially approved. We're basically waiting for a signature um, to approve this JP science plan, but you'll notice up above this, that was just this last week, we've already started planning and implementing the plan. So we, 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 we've we been working so closely with Department of Fish and Wildlife and, and also the other um, agencies represented on the core team that we felt we could actually move forward with the planning. There was stuff we just knew was going to happen. Um, the ultimate goal here is on the, in October of 2024, we have to submit a final um recommended approach for producing the jpe and um then that'll go through review again at cdfw we'll revise and if all goes well on january 2025 we will produce a jpe that um at that point may be used for entrainment management we'll see how that goes so just to give you an overview of this work plan which once it's officially approved, we will be posting online and sharing with anyone that wants to look at it. Um, the scope, um, the resolution of the scope is, is what we're calling medium level. Um, it's essentially a plan for a bunch of other plans um, with some detail where we could flesh it out. There's gonna be lots of research and development um, going on. Uh, we're not just locking in on one JPE approach and then trying to um, figure out how to implement that. We're going to be experimenting with a bunch of different um, way, potential ways of developing a juvenile production estimate. Um, we're also developing a bunch of tools to support that. Um, and I think most importantly, the approach, not only our approach in the research and development, but once we have that JPE in place, it's designed to evolve over time with ongoing research and development to improve um, the process. So like I, I mentioned before, we're considering multiple approaches. Um, and by that, what I mean is we're, we're essentially thinking that the input variable, the abundance variable that we input to um, into our mathematical models to then end up coming up with a prediction of how many juveniles will enter the delta. Um, we're thinking, uh, we're going considering 
all different life stages, essentially, once those adults enter the tributaries. Um, one reason this, this is so much harder than, a couple of reasons why this is so much harder than the um, winter run, producing a winter run JPE. For one thing, the spring run are, are spread out across a lot more tributaries. So it, it could potentially involve a lot more monitoring, um, a lot more effort. Um, and the other issue um, that I'm trying to remember because it slipped my mind just now is um, that the spring run tend to, they trickle out they don't like the the winter run tend to come out in a, a much tighter group and we can measure them up at the red bluff diversion dam and have a pretty good estimate before they start entering the delta of how many juveniles will enter the delta whereas with the spring run they're trickling out throughout the season there's um both young of the year and yearlings that um life life um what do they call that um stages that can come out and so it's, it's just it's a very complicated um so one thing that we did is we developed um a series of conceptual models and this is just one example um this is this would be a jpe that's based on adult passage into tributaries and just to get an idea of like okay here's here's our primary monitored abundance um life stage abundance and there's and there's a bunch of different transition parameters that would have to be estimated before um, you estimate the abundance of juveniles leaving those tributaries, and then you have to consider survival down the Sacramento River until they enter the delta to come up with a final JPE. So just to get an idea of the kind of work that that's going to be necessary to understand um, what's coming out of these tributaries. Let's see. So, like, we are going to have um, major research and development elements. Did this go backwards? Oh, yeah, this is an overview of the plan. Um, I feel like... So, we're going to have new monitoring and studies in a bunch of different streams. We are going to have um, a Delta Entry Monitoring Station. Um, we're going to have a Race ID program because you need to know um, which fish are the spring run if you're going to monitor them. Uh, we're going to develop quant uh, multiple quantitative models. Uh, we are going to create a data management system and a database in order to, to wrangle all that data together in order to feed the models. And um, we're going to develop a st structured decision-making process that will help us figure out which of these alternative models will ultimately be the approach we recommend. And it's, those things are not going to happen sequentially. They're going to happen in parallel. So the, the main takeaway from this table, which um, Ted describes as a as a temporal logarithmic temporal logarithmic table, because we have 21 all spelled out here, showing a bunch of deadlines that have to happen by the by August, and then sort of what we're going to do over the next couple of years, and then coming to our hard deadlines here over in 2024 in 2025. But the main takeaway here is that all of these things are happening at once. So in order to um, tackle this, we've, or we're in the process of establishing a bunch of different sub teams uh, from the core team. It's not necessarily, um, it's not just members of the core team. In fact, many of the core team members probably won't even be represented on these teams. These are really these outreach teams where we're going and we're con contracting or reaching out to experts. And we're going to have a race ID sub team. And the names that I have here are, are tentative leads um, for these teams. Um, Melinda Bearwall at DWR is going to um, work with Jeff Rodson at DFW to manage this race ID sub team. We have a monitoring coordination sub team that Anna Allison will be leading. We have a data management sub team and a quantitative modeling sub team that um, DWR's Pete Nelson will be leading. And then to develop the structured decision-making process, um, that's really in its infancy. We're putting a little bit of the cart before the horse here. Um, I will be leading that team. And then down below here, once we get this monitoring coordination team together and figure out um, who's really going to manage the boots on the ground for the um, research and development, we um, will be developing a bunch of um, sub-sub teams, I'll call them, 
for the various streams, the representative streams, and I'll talk a little bit more about this idea of representative streams in a bit, um, and also a Delta Entry Monitoring Station. And I just wanted to point out up here that the core team, um, there's a core, the core of the core team is really just Ted, Somer, and I, and Brooke Jacobs, and Anna Allison from DFW. So we're, if you have major, you know, big questions you want to ask, we're the people to go to. So this new monitoring and studies, um, we realize we can't do everything everywhere at once. We have to get, we're supposed to be in the monitoring these fish like almost from this summer, um, start monitoring these life stages in order to, to develop a JPE in three years. Um, so we decided as a group that we would focus on a set of what we we're calling representative streams. The, the, the idea being that there may, we don't necessarily have to go into every stream as long as we can come up with a, a subset of streams that give us the range of possible um, challenges and um, that we're going to face that we can then use to develop a long-term monitoring plan in, in a number of years. And at the same time, it'll help us figure out how we're going to deal with our data streams and, and, and help feed our models. And in these streams, and, the, and I think I mentioned this before, but in these streams, we're going to, going to be doing very, fairly comprehensive monitoring of the life stages. Um, and so we can experiment with using different life stage abundances and just seeing which one really ultimately um, comes up with a JPE um, and through some sort of a, like a, an effort um, benefits type analysis, figure out you know, which is the best way to go to reduce the JPE uncertainty. Um, so we selected a bunch of representative streams, and that just happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, we did this by establishing a bunch of selection criteria. Is everybody seeing this um, thing up here at the top of the screen? Seems like every time I move the laser, that pops up for me, but I'm hoping it's not popping up for everyone else. Um, but anyway, we just established a, a set of selection criteria, the first one being um, we want to definitely monitor the streams that are producing the most spring run because we know we're going to have to do that. Um, next, we'd like to spread out um, the diversity have a, in of the streams that we that we experiment in, do this research and development in. Um, and so we have very we had various sort of ways of thinking about like the the diversity groups. Um, we had the core one. Um, core two diversity groups. We had upper, middle, and lower river, and we had various sorts of sub criteria that we thought about. Um, then the next stage we wanted to think about was um, the feasibility of doing monitoring. If we had two streams that sort of seemed like they were similar and we weren't quite sure which one we should go into, for going through the first two filter processes, then we would consider, well, which one is just going to be, you know, easier from a permitting perspective, an access perspective, um, what what's going on in that stream? Maybe it only would take a little bit more to, to, to fill out the rest of that, um, of that those various life stages that we want to monitor. And then we could take all that saved effort and put it somewhere else. And then finally, after all of that, we want to consider sort of the non-JPE learning opportunities. And that's not only for just spring run, but also for non-spring run. And this is for steelhead and we're, we've been talking to um, Mike Beeks about the upcoming steelhead monitoring program that he's working on, um, working on putting together and trying to coordinate as much as possible. So out of that, um, we we decided that we would definitely be monitoring in the Feather River and the Butte River because they produce the most spring run. On the other hand, there's these streams that produce um, spring run only intermittently, and um, we don't want to go and put a ton of monitoring into a stream where there may, you know, there may be no spring run. So those dropped out. Um, the next tier in these diversity groups, we selected um, deer, between deer and meal, we selected um, deer creek, um, even though they're not necessarily rep representing each other we we figured they were close enough that we would select one of these we decided to go up into um between the battle creek clear creek and the upper sack we would just focus on battle and clear creek 
the there's a lot of monitoring going on up here already. It may not take much at all for us to fill, fill that out. And then if we have enough um, money left over, essentially, we'll figure out, we'll, we're going to cons strongly consider doing uh, monitoring the Yuba as well. And you can see that's so that that handout here to, to deer, clear, battle, Yuba, feather, and butte. And those are essentially our representative streams. So delta entry monitoring, we're, get, we're going to establish some way of monitoring spring run entering the delta. We're going to use this as a um, some sort of a you know for validation essentially. And I don't want I won't talk too much more about that. We haven't thought that out very clearly. Um, the race ID aspect of it is really interesting, I think, because we're going to be combining the um, probabilistic length at date modeling that Noble Hendricks has been developing for winter run. Um, we're going to enlist him to do that for spring run as well. And then we're going to have a sort of a feedback thing going on between the genetics testing and the plaid so that we can um, figure out which are the most important fish to test in the field. And then the genetics test can go back and make the plaid more accurate. But we don't, that way we won't be testing, um, doing genetic tests on fish that we're fairly certain are spring run. Uh, so we're working on, you know, there's going to be coordination going on throughout this process, particularly between the race ID team and the monitoring team. Um, in order to figure out what the monitoring teams are going to have to do to feed the race ID team and what the race ID team needs to do to help the monitoring team figure out which fish are spring run. I'm going to start racing through these a little bit. Um, and our quantitative modeling team, uh, I think we've I've covered this, but um, Essentially, they're going to be not only help, helping uh, put these models together, but they're going to be helping produce um, uncertainty estimates that we can use to make our final selection process. Um, so we have this data management team, and they're not only tasked with putting together a bunch of all the current data so that we can start building out these quantitative models, but they're also tasked with coordinating with the, uh, monitoring teams and figuring out the best way and the easiest way for those regional staff to um, enter and upload data into the database. And then they're also co coordinating with the modeling team to make sure that that data is in a form that that's, can be um, brought into the data processing. And then finally, um, on structured decision-making, our plan is to follow a somewhat modified structured decision-making process. Um, it's not, in our hands to determine whether what the final selection will be for um, for spring run JPE approach. However, um, we are making that we're making a recommendation, but ultimately the final the final decision lays with this adaptive management team. So, for traditional structured decision making, you know we need to really understand well if we decide on a certain approach, what are the what's the outcome of that going to be as far as a management and how it's used and that's not that's not within the scope of the JPE team but what we will be doing is using um, various kinds of decision analysis to for instance the um, value of new information type analysis to figure and also uncertainty analysis just to really hone in on what what the best approach will be and that's it did I run out of time? No, I just set a timer thanks. and I, I went way over my time. Yeah, uh, you're a few minutes over, but that's okay. Appreciate the the information. I know it's it's a lot to cover, and I know the group, the folks have been working really hard. So um, I don't, I didn't notice any particular questions in the chat, but you might just check that and encourage folks to follow up with Brett directly if you have questions about what he's and the rest of that that team or teams have been up to. Um, so I'm going to just quickly hand the baton to Rebecca if she's out there to talk about some of the acoustic telemetry work that um, and data analysis that she's been involved with in the South Delta. So floor is yours, Rebecca. All right. Thank you. All right. So can you see my presentation? We can. Thanks. All right. Great. Thanks. 
So I'm going to talk about uh, outcomes and challenges in acoustic telemetry monitoring of steelhead in the South Delta. I'm going to do this first in the context of the six-year study uh, and then kind of broaden that to more general comments. So the six-year study was, in fact, a six-year study that ran from 2011 through 2016. Uh, in the South Delta, we were estimating survival from the lower San Joaquin River uh, through the Delta to Chips Island. And we're also uh, trying to confirm proportional causes of mortality through the South Delta, a portion to Delta inflow water exports, the ratio of inflow to exports or the IE ratio, the status of the barrier at the head of Old River and OMR. This study was a collaborative effort. It was led by the Bureau of Reclamation with uh, participation by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, USGS, and DWR. We released over 8,000 acoustic tagged uh, juvenile hatchery omicus in the spring over these six years. And we collected over 600,000 detection events on 84 telemetry lines. And actually those detection events were already at a process level of the data. So we actually had many more records that were uh, collected initially. So I'm gonna talk about uh, four basic topics on a fairly high level. How have we used these data? What types of things have we learned? What new investigations might we get out of these data or similar types of studies? And then what challenges did we encounter in, um, in using these data for, for this purpose and what what might be do in the future to um, kind of accommodate that. So I'll start with um, the conditions during the study as far as oops, delta inflow, exports, and water temperature go. On uh, these curves, we've got the different colors representing the different years and the dots representing the release dates. Looking first at the left plot for delta inflow, what's obvious here is that uh, inflow was really different in 2011 than in the other years. 2011 was a wet year. The other years were either dry or critically dry. And so we had a lot of variability between years in the sense that one year was very different than the others, but not so much among five years of the, of the study and not as much within each year of the study. So that represented some modeling challenges. For exports, uh, there was some overlap, more overlap, I guess, in exports than in inflow inflow to some extent, but we had kind of low variability in exports overall, at least compared to uh, how exports might vary throughout the rest of the year. And part of that is because there's a policy of generally re restricted exports during the spring migration, um, which is fine. And also we had, uh, if you don't have much water, then you can't, you can't pump a lot of water. So there's a little bit of a positive correlation there between inflow and exports and a relatively low variability in some of the years, certainly, for exports. For water temperature, uh, it increases through the season. It's negatively correlated with delta inflow. It's not a big surprise there, but I wanted to show you what it looked like. Here's a map of the uh, where we put the receivers. This is from the 2016 uh, study. This was the last year of the study, and we kept adding receiver locations throughout the study, so this is the most complicated one. Starting at the bottom left corner or bottom right corner of the map, we released fish at Durham Ferry, which is about, I think, 20 kilometers upstream of the Head of Old River. I've marked the Head of Old River there where fish can either stay in the San Joaquin or enter Old River. Uh, then farther downstream, we've got Turner Cut, which is another place where fish can enter the interior delta. And then I've also marked uh, the CVP and Clifton Court Forebay over there in the middle of the map, and then Chips Island. So just a really brief one slide overview of how we've used these data. And this is uh, possibly just a sample. I don't necessarily know how all the data are being used, but uh, certainly these are three, I think, big uses of the data. The first is estimation of migration survival and also routing probabilities at those different junctions that I mentioned and route specific survival. And so we estimate this using multi-state release recapture models. I have a model schematic for part of this model. This was from the 2012 study. So fish would start, uh, enter this schematic essentially at the bottom and then work their way up the screen to exit at Chips Island at the top. The benefit of using the model is that it allows us to account for missed detections at the various detection sites. 
So uh, estimating the survival, I think of that as kind of a snapshot of, of, the, uh, of the release group and their performance through the system. What did it, uh, what they look like using in relation to whatever their conditions were. You get one number essentially, or one number plus a, a precision estimate. Um, we also use these data to model survival in relation to water project operations or other covariates. And that's also on multiple spatial scales. The covariates that we've really focused on have been delta inflow exports, IE ratio and so forth, as we were um, asked initially. So I've been working on this on uh, kind of a large regional scale or a total delta scale using individual based multinomial regression models. USGS is doing a concurrent um, or maybe just a current analysis and they are modeling survival jointly with travel time and routing on all of the reaches concurrently. And they're using a hierarchical Bayesian model and they are in the middle of the model fits for that right now. And then another use of these data is to model small scale or localized fish movement. And there are a couple of different projects that have uh, taken a stab at this. One is out of UC Santa Cruz, the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. They've used these data to calibrate an enhanced particle tracking model, which is based on invection dispersion equations. And um, so then they can track the fish through the system. And Anchor QEA and USGS is also uh, taking a, a stab at this with a multi-state movement model in relation to a 3D hydrodynamics model. So the idea in both of these cases is that we can predict uh, something about how the, the water's moving in relation to management actions and then predict how the fish are moving and integrate that over space and time to derive an estimate of survival or fish fate as an emergent property. Um, so I'm gonna show you some results, very high level results from my analysis, which has focused on these top couple of items. So I'm gonna look at just a few spatial scales, kind of large spatial scales. First, the Hedevold River to Chips Island. Um, on the left, I have the estimates of uh, the release specific survival. So for each individual release group, we have an estimate of survival and I've color coded that by migration route through the system. The San Joaquin is in gray, the Old River is in blue. And we see that survival has varied through, uh, throughout the study, both between years and within years. It looks like it's higher in the San Joaquin route. Um, certainly for some release groups, it's quite distinctively higher than in the Old River route, but uh, not so much in other release groups. On the right, we have the modeled survival as a function of delta inflow. And you'll notice there's multiple curves there. That's because there was a strong year effect in uh, the intercepts. So I wanted to show you how those varied over the different years. And this particular one is without the barrier. We also had a model with the barrier uh, that was similar in nature. Um, but I'm just gonna show you uh, this one for now. For the Hedevold River to Turner Cut, we have the same types of estimates. Uh, survival is much higher in this reach for some of the release groups, but not for all the release groups. So there's still quite a bit of diversity there. And then from Turner Cut to Chips Island, same idea. Once again, here we have route specific survival. And what's really apparent here is that survival is considerably lower for fish that enter the interior delta via Turner Cut than for those that stay in the San Joaquin at this river junction. And in fact, when I modeled survival as a function of route and then other covariates, the only thing that came out uh, significant was really route. I also looked at delta inflow, IE ratio, exports, things like that, OMR. All of those are measured at quite a distance from this location. So it's perhaps not surprising that it didn't account for uh, much of the variability in survival in this region. But there is some variability and it would be useful to figure out what is uh, associated or what are the conditions that promote high survival in this region. And then we also uh, asked whether or not we could detect a drought effect in these data. And uh, we did not actually see a drought effect in the regression modeling, but when we plotted survival uh, as in the form of cumulative survival in the San Joaquin River route as shown here, we do see a drought effect. So I've, we've got cumulative survival, it's scaled by the reach length. And so the slope of these curves gives you an, an idea of the intensity of the mortality process. 
And what we're seeing here is that for those three ex uh, extreme drought years, 2013, 2014, 2015, they all have uh, a steep drop in survival between the Hedevold River and uh, Garbid Bridge and then Turner Cut Junction. And it's pretty different from what we're seeing in the non-drought years. So just cursely, I would say, yes, we can see a drought effect in the data and it's, it's uh, really affecting that reach between the Hedevold River and Turner Cut. Okay, so um, we have more results, but that's what I'm gonna show you for now. Additional investigations that we can do with these data. I think there's, there's quite a bit. Um, we could do more with modeling travel time, residence time and routing. I've done some modeling of routing on an annual basis at the Head of Old River and Tunicut, and I didn't really see a lot there. There, was, <laughs> there wasn't a lot in the data to show. Um, on the other hand, USGS is modeling travel time and routing along with survival. So I'm be very interested to see what they come up with. I think it would be useful to uh, explore the sensitivity of the total delta survival in terms of different routing decisions or different changes in travel time in various locations. We could do more with modeling fish direction and fate in certain regions, at least potentially the Older Middle River Corridor or Frank's Track and False River as the functions of different covariates, either reflecting management actions or conditions. Um, we are a little bit limited here in the sample sizes from these data. So we didn't have all that many fish that made it to those regions. So we may actually need to do some more tagging for that. We also have predator data for two of the years. Uh, 150 predators tagged in the San Joaquin part of the Delta in 2014 and 2015, and a little bit of those data extending into 2016. So we could do some joint models of uh, movement of steelhead and predators together to get an idea of how, how their movements differ, and that would be helpful for some of the rest of the analysis, as I will address. There are additional questions that we could look at as well. Um, with telemetry studies, and I've broken these down into both monitoring versus testing effectiveness. Uh, I, it seems like there's maybe a little bit of a convolution of them, and I do want to think of them as being different because they they I think they require different types of approaches. For monitoring, uh, certainly we can continue monitoring survival in the delta. We can also use a telemetry to model survival upstream. Here I'm thinking of juvenile survival, but we could also do adults if we could collect the adults to get the tags in them. Um, there are performance measures in the delta that we could um, monitor with acoustic telemetry, potentially pre-screen loss, post-release survival after salvage. I'm sure there are others. For testing effectiveness, this would be useful for uh, investigations of the effectiveness of some sort of management action on uh, performance measures like survival or residence time, something that we can measure based on fish movement, essentially. So at the water pro export facilities, I've listed a couple of ideas there um, on uh, different management operations and their effect on, say, residence time in the Clifton Court Forebay or inside the fish facilities, outside the fish facilities. Uh, otherwise, in the rest of the Delta or uh, in the San Joaquin upstream, pick your favorite management action and we can explore the effect on, say, survival and residence time. These are gonna be requiring, of course, new studies. So there's a lot of potential with acoustic telemetry. There's also some challenges, and we need to be aware of those as we uh, consider using an expanded telemetry uh, system for monitoring. First, uh, I would call these logistical challenges, and without getting into details about you know, specific challenges of like actually putting, say, the hydrophones out into a, a big water site. I'll just say that these are costly studies. The hydrophones are expensive, the tags are expensive. It takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of knowledge to make these studies work so that you can actually get uh, unbiased estimates of the parameters that you're trying to estimate. And I will say that this, this, this region is really good at it. So we know how to do it, um, but that doesn't mean it's not costly. So I think that one thing we should consider is combining telemetry with less intensive methods. Maybe we do telemetry studies every two or three or four years, and we do the less invasive monitoring on a more regular basis. As well, we 
should be carefully considering where we're putting our receivers and where we're putting our releases. And again, I think that this system has done a really good job of that. There are analysis challenges as well. Uh, because we get so much data from each of these studies, there's a lot of data to process, and that results in a time lag uh, between when we collect the data and when the analysis is available. And that's really a potential problem for adaptive management. There are some methods uh, already in place that have automated analysis on kind of a large spatial scale for adaptive management. The um, Fish Tracking Consortium, I think, has done this, and there's it seems like that's mostly in the Sacramento, but there's some in the San Joaquin as well and estimating uh, through Delta survival, I think, primarily for Spring Chinook, I believe, but we could use it for steelhead. I think we would also benefit from, de from uh, developing some of these on a smaller spatial scale uh, so that we can address some of the more precise uh, performance measures or questions, say within the Delta, for example, whether it's real-time data or just faster analysis. Uh, is something that we can discuss. One of the issues with an, analyzing the data is uh, dealing with tag predation, especially in the delta. So if you have your tag study fish and a predator of some sort eats that study fish, while the tag is in the predator's gut and it can still be detected when it goes past a receiver. And so that detection is going to indicate not survival and presence of your, stag, of your tagged study fish, but instead something else. And so we need to uh, deal with those data in some way, those, those, they're a sort of false detection. And we need to deal with that in the analysis. And there's been a variety of different methods used in uh, the Central Valley for identifying such detections and dealing with them. Some of those methods, well, all of those methods, I would say, have some level of subjectivity. Some of them take a long time to implement. So I think we really need a better understanding of the sensitivity of our results to those different methods and to this problem in general and some standardized methods. Uh, we could also use some analytical methods for the PDAT tags, which will tell you when the tag has been predated. So in general, um, I think that we could use some standardized methods for analysis and also analysis tools for a number of different components of the analysis to facilitate the effectiveness of telemetry for adaptive management. And then the last set of challenges um, is what I think of as inferential challenges. And these are not really limited to telemetry data, although some of them are. Um, I think that these apply to tagging studies in general, and some of them would just apply to monitoring in general. So, Telemetry specifically is particularly good for a single life stage um, or potentially maybe a couple of life stages that are really close together in time. And the reason I say that is because they have a battery and the battery fails. So it's not going to be useful for estimating something like a small to adult return rate because it's not going to last through the uh, marine life stage. We also can't tag particularly small fish because the battery makes the tags large and heavy. As uh, technology develops, those tags keep getting smaller, but there's always going to be some limit. So we do need um, upstream demographic moder monitoring in order to put these studies using telemetry into context of the population and the, po uh, the life cycle and the population structure. As far as modeling relationships between, say, survival and conditions that might reflect um, uh, management decisions, there's a couple of issues. One really relates to the question of system variability or the lack thereof. So if you have a very variable system, uh, it's gonna take you longer to develop a, re a reliable model of a relationship between, let's say survival and Delta inflow. In the six year study, we had one year of high inflow and five years of low inflow. That may actually be a good representation of the variability of the, of the study or the system but we're going to need more than one year to, of high flows to develop a reliable model and a useful model of survival as a function of inflow. And so a highly variable system is going to require more years to study. If we have a covariate that doesn't vary much at all, we are not going to be able to estimate either an effect of that, uh, of that covariate, even if it exists, or uh, fit a, a useful model. So for example, for exports, we were expecting that there would be a negative effect of exports on survival through the Delta. 
but that's not what we saw with the six year study. And so the question is, is that, we, do we not see it because it doesn't exist or did we not see it because there is an effect, but the data were not uh, varying enough to show us. So if the export levels were not varying sufficiently uh, in our study, then we're not gonna be able to, to detect a relationship there. So um, I think there's some issues there with uh, observational studies versus experiments that we could talk about. There's also issues with correlated covariates. If we wanna confirm the proportional uh, causes of mortality, well, those causes of mortality are all correlated. So it's gonna be very difficult to, to do that. There's also questions with the definitions of covariates. Where do you measure them over what time frame? It's maybe not as big a deal. We can certainly figure that out, but I think it would be helpful to determine that uh, before we spend a lot of time uh, using the results of these, uh, of these tagging studies. There are some other limitations of tagging studies or maybe even just monitoring in general. I think they're really good at addressing the current status of a system and modeling survival, uh, or excuse me, relationships that are expressed over a short period of time. In particular, the time period of the study. I think they're really great at that. They're not so good at identifying systemic change, certainly not historical systemic change, um, the predictions are not going to work anymore if there is future ecosystem change. On the other hand, they're really good at identifying that ecosystem change. So we do need to continue the monitoring in order to, to uh, well, develop relationships and also identify this change. So my relation or my recommendations are do you continue with the monitoring um, as far as using these studies to help address management questions, there's always gonna be new management questions and we have a variable system. It's gonna take decades to answer some of these questions. So we need to be doing the monitoring before we ask the questions so that we have a baseline to work with. Um, also, if we really wanna know the effect of some man potential management action on survival, residence time, other uh, responses, an observational monitoring study may not be sufficient. We may actually need to do an experimental design such as before, after control impact or randomized block designs with commitment to monitoring in the before period and, and uh, commitment to using the designated treatments. And that I know is challenging, but uh, that's gonna give you the data structure and the inferential structure that you need to come to the most defensible results. So my final thoughts are, uh, the six-year study provided a lot of really new and important data on steelhead survival and habitat use in the, in the Delta. It showed us results that were very different from what we've gotten from uh, Chinook in the Delta. So it's really quite exciting. It also demonstrated that acoustic telemetry is a really powerful technology. It gives us rich data sets. It's also not perfect. There are these challenges. So I think that as, I think we should use it. And I think that as we use it, we should do it very thoughtfully in context with other monitoring and also in the context of a well-defined monitoring and experimental design. And so with that, I will uh, just acknowledge a whole bunch of people that have, uh, that I've worked with specifically on some of these studies and some of these ideas. And there are many more people that were involved in actually implementing the six year study. And I wanna thank them as well. And that's it. Great, thanks so much, Rebecca. Appreciate that. Um, so we have one more presentation. We're running just a few minutes behind, but we'll just um, run this presentation till to the end, and then and then we'll take our break and come back at eleven thirty. So uh, why don't we go ahead and move right into that? Um, so is Malty out there somewhere? Yeah, I am. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. You can see my slides? I can. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Well, uh, thanks so much for having me. This has been a really great workshop so far. Uh, my name is Malte Wilmes. I'm a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz and NOAA. And in, in this talk, I just kind of wanted to provide um, a general overview of how we can use Otolis to look into um, steelhead monitoring, so age, growth, and anatomy. 
Um, there's a couple of people I want to acknowledge that have been really instrumental in putting this talk together, and specifically um, Chris Donahue, who has provided some um, some slides as well. So, um, yeah, that's, that was really nice of him. So the three things that I wanted to cover in this talk are, first of all, what can we learn from Otolis? Um, that might be a repetition for many of you in this call. I still think it's useful to go over it in detail. And then with the help of Chris Donner, we look at a case study on the McCullamy River where we looked at rainbow trout and steelhead. And then at the very end, I just want to provide some ideas that I have about how Otolis can contribute to monitoring and managing steelhead in the Samokin Basin. And I wanted to start out saying as well that Otolis studies, there, there really aren't that many outside for steelhead in the Central Valley. First of all, there isn't that many for steelhead in general, but then in, in the Central Valley, there are really only a few studies. So, so far, this has been kind of an underutilized tool. So before we go too far again, um, uh, what are Otolis? Really quick, if I can interrupt just a quick second. Yeah, sure. Um, if you could minimize that little box down at the bottom right corner, it, it's showing oh. up as a dark box on our screen. <laughs> Got it. Thanks so much for letting me know. Yep. Um, right. So, so what are Otolis? Um, they are ear stones. They're tiny calcified structures in the inner ear of fish, and fish use those for balance, hearing, predator evasion. Um, they grow incrementally, and so they're extremely useful for us because they grow continuously, they form incremental growth layers, and as they grow, they incorporate environmental and physiological signals into their uh, calcium carbonate structure. And they're also metabolically inert, so once they put down these layers, they don't change much at all. Um, as you can maybe guess from the picture up there, and as most of you probably know, like Otolus collection is pretty lethal. So in terms of steelhead, that's something we definitely have to consider. Um, one of the very basic things we can do with Otolis just by their shape, it can tell us about what kind of fish species we are dealing with. This is a slide from a 2019 study looking at coral reef sediments. So we don't have coral reefs in the San Francisco estuary, but if we think about some applications, for example, uh, bird scat dropped fish. We can just look at different, at different otolith shapes and that can tell us a little bit about the type of fish we find. Um, these are two uh, examples from Point Blue. And the bottom here is really, I think, pretty interesting. These are least tern preying on Chinook salmon. And we're finding these Chinook salmon up to 75 millimeters. Um, and we can find the otolith. So just by their shapes, this is something um, it, it's an interesting application of the Otolith tool. Um, the other really basic thing we can do is we can look at just at the Otolith uh, size. So as a fish grows, so does the Otolith. So just by looking at the size of the Otolith, we can start reconstructing fish size. The bottom graph here is from Donahue et al. 2015, showing that we can do this for rainbow trout on the McCullamy River, and we get a pretty good relationship. The so top graph is for um, for run Chinook salmon, species I mostly work with. And how that's useful for salmon is when we do our carcass surveys, sometimes there's not that much, that much fish that we find, right? It would be really difficult to get a fork length or standard length uh, from, from just the head. But with the Otolus, we can start looking into that and kind of fill out our monitoring data. Um, the next thing is we can look at annual ages. So if we send down the otolus, we can identify all kinds of different check marks within the otolus and different annual ages. So this is an example also from Chinook salmon. These are from Puda Creek, showing two-year-old, three-year-old, and four-year-old fish. Um, and all the different marks we can identify just by, by, by looking at the structure and the otolus. If we look at juvenile fish, if we send down the, the otolith a little bit further, we can actually look at daily uh, ages and daily growth rings. And now combining that with our knowledge that how otoliths grow, we can start reconstructing growth and size at age. Um, then the work that I'm mostly involved in is doing the, the microchemistry, so analyzing the otoliths along the same transect um, that we do for our aging and um, looking at a whole range of different elements and isotope ratios that tell us different things about the life history of the fish. 
one of the most common applied ratios here in the central valley is 87, 86 strontium, strontium, calcium, barium, calcium ratios. So those tell us about geography, about location. But there's a whole other range of traces that we could be looking into and that have been developed for otoliths of different fish species. Um, quickly, because we use it here so much, is strontium isotope ratios basically vary depending on geology. So they vary between different watersheds. And they get incorporated into the otoliths really pretty much without any fractionation. So we have a really solid relationship between the watershed strontium ratios and the otoliths. And so Rachel Johnson and collaborators have developed a strontium isoscape that um, works really well distinguishing different uh, freshwater rivers and also rivers from hatcheries even within the same watershed. And um, I think this is something where we can, um, we can leverage a lot of the work that has been done on other fish species. If we're thinking about applying this for steelhead, we don't, we're not starting from zero. We already have this isoscape that's really well developed. Um, once the river so enters the delta and we have the Sacramento and the San Joaquin mixing with ocean waters in the San Francisco estuary, strontium isotope ratios become more of a tracer for salinity rather than location. And this is some work that Jim Hobbs and colleagues have done in 2019, looking at how we can use strontium isotope ratios to trace salinity history of a fish. So we can distinguish freshwater regions from um, low salinity zones to medium salinity, up to like eight or 10 PSU. After that, it gets uh, a little bit tricky, but we can still detect ocean entry. Um, and that, of course, allows us to look at anatomy and migration for steelhead. And so when we combine these two, uh, two ideas together and we think back about all the growth and age reconstructions we can do, that really means we get a time-resolved habitat use that we can study using otoliths. So we can look at connectivity and straying. We could look at size at migration. We can look at age at migration. And we can look at this over pretty much the entire watershed with a little problem of having higher salinities becoming um, much more uncertain. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to recap about otoliths is that we can also actually look at the maternal phenotype. So this is a picture again of a, steelhead otoliths, and the very center core of this otolith actually uh, uses or starts forming using the material that the uh, um, mother provided uh, during maturation. So if the mother of this fish was a steelhead, reared in the ocean and then came back, we will get a strontium isotope profile pretty much like the top graph there, where we have this core of the otolith looking very similar to the ocean. And using this tool um, in other watersheds, we uh, could have all um, looked at yeah, the maternal phenotype and were able to distinguish steelhead and rainbow trout progeny. And then Zimmermann et al. 2009 did the same thing for um, the Central Valley, looking um, across a number of different watersheds here um, and finding that the uh, percentages or the contribution of steelhead progeny was quite variable um, between different, yeah, between between different watersheds. We can see it's in Deer Creek, it's it's really high, whereas then in the Stanislaus and the Masset River, it's very low. Um, okay, so so keeping all these tools in mind. Um, and moving to the McCallum River, and these are some slides that Chris uh, Donner who provided. Um, looking at the life history here of uh, rainbow trout and steelhead. And so uh, some of the questions that were investigated was the relative abundance of anadromous freshwater migrants and residents, the connectivity among these life forms, and the connectivity uh, with other rivers. And um, you probably all know where the lower McCallum River is, but we can zoom in here. And so samples were collected both from hatchery and wild origin fish. Uh, the hatchery origin fish were all at clipped adults, pretty much collected at the hatchery. The natural origin fish came uh, from a stretch of the river, were all not clipped. And then they also looked at H0 fish and smalls collected from uh, rotary screw traps. Um, just an overview of the samples that uh, were looked at. So there's about 120 or so hatchery origin fish about 100 adult natural origin fish, and then another 70 or so 
younger fish. Um, so the first thing we can look at is the natal origin. We concentrate on that um, graph on the left there. So that's for the natural origin fish. And we can see that most of the natural origin fish also came from the lower McCallum River. So not much connectivity with other river sources. And the same is true for the hatchery origin fish. They all showed a hatchery signature um, for the McCallum River. So there were some transplants from the Feather River, Feather River hatchery as well during this time. We can see there's also a little bit of exchange between the two populations, and then some smaller contributions from um, the Feather River, the Sacramento River, and the American River. So just based on these analysis, it looks like the McCullum River steelhead and rainbow trout population um, doesn't have much connectivity with other sources in the Central Valley. We can look at the relative abundance of the different life forms. And again, distinguishing here natural origin and hatchery origin fish. So the natural origin fish were mostly residents, so rainbow trout, with some freshwater migrants as well. And we haven't really talked about freshwater migrants uh, too much in this workshop, but th those are basically fish, right, that, that migrate to a different river to, to the low salinity zone somewhere in the delta that don't become fully anatomous. For the hatchery origin fish, it was pretty interesting. Actually, most of those were anadromous, so steelhead. And then a huge contingent as well of freshwater migrants with very few residents. Um, and then the last thing, or the next thing we can look at is the maternal origin. So for natural population, maternal origin was mostly non-anadromous. So freshwater residents or freshwater migrants. And the exact opposite is really true for, for, the, for the hatchery origin fish, where most of the um, maternal origin was, was still there. So uh, looking back at the Zimmerman at all 2009 papers and the Columbia River is about 13%, uh, the progeny of steelhead. <clears throat> um, sorry, this, this is looking at the natural population here. So 13%, um, and again, here to highlight uh, Deer Creek, right, with nearly 100% or 100% in those years for fish age three and four. Um, interesting as well, looking at the maternal origin of age zero and smolt, uh, and seeing that there really isn't that much of a difference. So that a lot of the smolt uh, moving through the system are also from uh, non anadromous um, mothers. And we can start building these, these models. And first, again, looking at the natural origin fish here, we can see that um, non-anadromous moms basically produce non-anadromous uh, uh, smalls and adults. Uh, but there is one-way connectivity coming from the anadromous uh, population, where about 77% of their um, progeny then uh, become to residents. And we see a pretty different trend for the hatchery origin, but both non-anadromous moms and anadromous moms uh, contribute to both anadromous and non-anadromous uh, adults. Um, so that was a super quick overview of, um, of an application on the McCallum River. Um, the, the report is really well written. There's, there's lots of details in there that I, didn't, that I didn't cover. But I wanted to highlight what we can do um, with our autolist tools and how, um, how this can be applied in, uh, in the Samarkin River watershed. So we found for natural origin, residence fish, pretty low connectivity, whereas on the hatchery, we have pretty high, uh, highly mixed origins and more or higher connectivity. The hatchery population, all life history types are present. In the natural origin, it's mostly, um, it's mostly rainbow trout residents and some freshwater migrants. And overall, we find very few strays from other rivers and hatcheries when they're not transplanted. And I just wanted to end here um, thinking about how we could um, apply these tools, how we could move forward. I think one of the really neat things um, about using Autolus for steelhead would be that we can leverage all that work that's been done on other species. So all the isoscapes, all the tools, all the validation studies we've done for Chinook salmon, for smelt, for sturgeon. It's been a lot of work, and I think it would be really neat to apply this to steelhead. Um, we can apply these tools to many different life stages, so juveniles to adults. We can also apply these tools, for example, um, I think on the first and second day we were discussing 
about uh, difficulties in monitoring fish in high water years. Well, we can look at fish when they come back two or three years later. Um, so we can look at fish that outmigrated in 2017. Um, we can look at anatomy and resident phenotypes. We can look at the connectivity among all these different life um, history types. And then how this changes between different rivers. And uh, when we have enough samples, of course, also with time. Um, I think Autoless play along really well with other methods, with genetics, with tagging, with acoustic telemetry, um, scales, obviously, as well. I think there's some really clear advantages of using scales because they are not lethal. Um, and scales have been used for many different fish species also to do microchemistry and all apply many of the similar tools we can do for Autoless. But we would also like to really validate these techniques, I think, for steelhead. So I see there could be some huge value in some really targeted studies looking at collecting scales and otoliths from the same fish, seeing how well these two methods agree, where they disagree, and why that might be the case. And again, otolith collection is lethal. I think it's not necessarily a surprise that these studies are underutilized for steelhead. We want to keep these fish alive. So I'm just going to say that, yeah, sample design is key. We need to figure out what exactly the question is that we want trying to answer and what the minimum sample size is that we can use to accomplish it. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much. That's really cool stuff. Um, amazing what you can learn from a small ear bone. So we are um, past our break time. So I'm gonna, as I've been suggesting, suggest that if you have questions, post them in the chat or reach out to Malti directly. Um, and if Malti, you wanna check the chat. Um, I'm not noticing, it looks like there, I don't see any questions right now, but um, you know, maybe just keep an eye on it. So I do want to get you all to your break so that you can, um, you know, get refreshed before we come back and do the breakouts. Um, just as a reminder, and for anybody that hasn't been here the last couple of days, um, we'll take a break till 1130. Please come back at 1130. Please leave your computers on um, so that we can sort you. Um, so when you come back at 1130, you'll find yourself in a breakout group. Um, and I do uh, encourage you to please come back. The breakouts have been really helpful and are providing us with a lot of feedback. We obviously with these presentations, we haven't had a lot of opportunity for dialogue. So the breakouts are really our, our opportunity for that and to get your, your input. So um, please do come back for that at 1130. That'll run till 1230 and then uh, we will um, be done. We won't do any kind of wrap. So after after the breakout, you're done for the day. and. So I'll, I'll say thank you to everyone now for, for all your, your participation and time. And again, please do come back at 1130, leave your computer on, and we'll pick things up then. Um, Brandon, Pascal, anything logistically we need to mention before folks wander off? Uh, one thing is, if you we should have mentioned this the last two days, but if you see a button that says join the room when we do um, the breakouts, don't press the button. <laughs> Don't push the button. <laughs> okay, thanks, Brandon. Okay, thanks, everyone. See you.